Hi, it's Kevin Trainer, and I'd like to welcome you to my lecture um, on uh, Chapter 6 of the Kathy Schwalbe book. And Chapter 6 is called Project Time Management. Uh, we start out the chapter by uh, just really trying to impress you with how important time management is for uh, PM. And the fact is that it, it's so important that a lot of people think that it's really all that there is to uh, PM, right? So when they think about PM, they think about all the stuff that we're going to talk about in the lecture uh, uh, here today. Okay, to the exclusion of all the other things that we claim are important as well. So pretty much everybody agrees that the time aspect of projects is pretty important stuff. Um, managers often cite uh, delivering projects on time as one of their biggest challenges. This is because, probably because, time has the least amount of flexibility so no matter what happens uh, time goes by and um, the research indicates that it is uh, schedule issues that serve as the main source of conflicts on projects especially as we get towards the end of a project where people realize they're not going to get what they wanted when they wanted. Um, so, you know, we try to integrate all the stuff that we talk about in the course, and especially when we're talking about uh, managing people, we talk about uh, things like uh, personality inventory test and that kind of stuff so we understand ourselves uh, well. And uh, one important aspect of managing time is really being in touch with the fact that we all don't have the same attitudes uh, towards uh, time. So how can we try to get some kind of handle on this? Well, um, we could take uh, a personality inventory test like uh, the Myers-Briggs uh, test. And we could look at how people come out uh, according to the Myers-Briggs type indicators. And uh, some people prefer to follow schedules and to meet their deadlines, and some uh, do not. So people uh, who have um, the type indicator J um, do, and the people who have type indicator P do not. In different cultures and even entire uh, countries have different attitudes with respect to time. Um, so uh, uh, an important kind of takeaway for the PM here is be aware of your attitudes towards time. Especially be aware of the attitudes that your stakeholders have with regard to time and most importantly that very important stakeholder the sponsor okay because um they're going to uh you know whether they're pleased or not uh is going to have a big influence on the rest of your career Okay, having talked about how important all this is, let's uh, get the lay of the land from a project manager and body of knowledge point of view, a la PMI. So um, here are the processes that are involved in this knowledge area. Planning, schedule management, defining activities, sequencing activities, estimating activity resources, estimating activity durations, developing the schedule, and controlling the schedule. And how do these uh, fit into the, uh, into the process groups? Well, not surprisingly, 
most of them fit into planning. So plan schedule management, define activities, sequence activities, estimate activity resources, estimate activity durations, develop schedule. These are all part of planning. And uh, control the schedule is part of monitoring and controlling. Not too surprisingly. So planning schedule management. Again, every one of the chapters that we have um, for each of the knowledge areas is going to begin by talking about uh, planning. And they really talk about planning on two levels, okay? One is uh, what, what kind of plants are going to come out of this knowledge area that are going to live in the overall integrated project plan for your project? And two, do you have a plan for how you're going to make that happen? Okay. So um, in planning schedule management, the project team uses expert judgment, analytical techniques, and meetings amongst the players to develop the schedule management plan. The schedule management plan can include a project schedule model, okay, uh, the scheduling methodology, level of accuracy in units of measure, like what we're, what our expectations are in those uh, regards, control thresholds, rules of performance measurement, reporting formats, process uh, descriptions. And I'm going to give you the advice here that I give on all these uh, chapters. Don't get scared off by this being a long and imposing list, okay? Um, in any organization, we have a way that we do these. Now, when you're new to it, you may not know them all, okay? And maybe your organization is kind of new to it, so we have to introduce uh, some. But um, really, any kind of a plan here is, is way ahead of no plan, okay? So um, we're going to acquire some of these things over time, right? And then some of these things are maybe going to be part of the policy, part of the governance for our, uh, our organization. So instead of having to dream them up, we're going to refer to them. And then the other thing is that we may be able to look at the uh, plan for schedule uh, management that was used in a previous uh, project and use a lot of that. Okay, so uh, don't get scared off. So, defining activities. An activity or task is an element of work normally found on the work breakdown structure, the WBS. Remember that from when we talked about scope. It has an expected duration, it has a cost, and it has resource requirements. So the duration, how long is it going to take? One day, three days, five days. A cost, well, we think uh, it's going to cost us in total $5,000. Resource requirements. We think that this activity will use um, two people with a, a particular skills, um, one machine that is in short supply, and uh, maybe a conference room for the duration. Okay? So those are the kind of things that we might think of as resources scarce resources that we have to allocate out and that um, sooner or later we have to pay for. Um, so uh, another thing that we're talking about here that I think is significant is when we define the activities for a project, we usually begin by looking at the very lowest level of the WBS. Now, when we created the WBS, we said that the lowest level of that, these things were called work packages, okay? And um, 
we're left a little bit of latitude about how small they are, okay? Typically, we don't want to do all the activity planning when we're trying to determine the scope. Um, it's kind of too much of trying to do everything at, at the same time. So um, a work package that would be at the bottom of the WBS plan, it might turn out to be a single activity when we start to develop the schedule, or more than likely, it would turn out to be several. Okay, because uh, maybe the WBS, even at the work package level, is a little more uh, summarized than that. Okay, so not uncommon at all to have one item on the WBS that's going to turn into uh, two or five or ten activities um, when we put together the schedule. Okay? Um, so activity definition involves developing a more detailed WBS. Okay, so these activities go down at lower hierarchy levels than we had before and supporting explanation to understand all the work to be done so you can develop a realistic cost and duration estimate. Okay? So, how do we go about this? Well, um, a lot of times this is pretty easy stuff because we're doing activities that we know quite well. Okay? And uh, how do we come up with a list of activities? Uh, well, we just go look at what we do every day. It's common knowledge. It's all around us. Okay? Uh, so sometimes uh, enumerating the activities that we're going to have to do to complete our project um, is pretty easy stuff. Okay? Sometimes it's darn hard though. Okay? Especially if we're doing something that we're new to or our organization is new to. Uh, or we're all new to, or perhaps has never been done before by anybody, well then, um, there's a bit of magic to it, okay? And it's going to take some uh, creative thinking to identify the activities that are going to lead to the results that we want. So we develop a list of activities, a so-called activity list. It's a tabulation of activities to be included on a project schedule that includes the activity name, an activity identifier number, and a brief description of the activity. And then we typically put, um, we collect more information about the activities that would be important for scheduling. Well, what kind of other things? Well, predecessor and successor activities part of our understanding of this time planning is that activities can have dependencies upon each other. Okay, so a predecessor activity is an activity that must be complete in order for our activity to start. A successor activity uh, can't start until our activity uh, completes. So we have predecessors, successors, logical relationships, leads and lags, resource requirements, constraints, imposed dates, and assumptions. So there's a lot of things that we could put on an activity list. Let's see if we can find one. Activity list. Oh, get down here. We used to have one in the last version of these slides. So I apologize. Well, so we don't have it. Uh, I'm going to tell you that, uh, and I guess we could have seen this back there, but activity lists are uh, typically um, the kind of information that we would put into activity attributes and put on an activity list. They're the kind of uh, pieces of information that we would feed into a project planning tool like 
Microsoft Project. Okay, so in Microsoft Project, when you come to the user interface, um, the so-called task entry view, where you are adding all these activities or uh, tasks, as they're called in MS Project, um, it's a spreadsheet, okay? And um, every line has an activity, uh, uh, has a name, it, it, it develops an identifier or number. Um, you can uh, put in a description of the activity. You can express things like predecessors and successors and leads and lags and all that kind of stuff. So um, even though we talk about the activity list as a, a separate uh, deliverable apart from the schedule, most people who are are uh, building this kind of a list are probably building it in some kind of planning tool. Okay, they've probably taken their WBS from Scope and they put it into a tool like Microsoft Project. And what they're doing is that they're trying to dream up what activities these work packages are going to break down into. And then as they define them, they start to fill in the information about uh, how they relate to each other. O okay, so activity identification is uh, here as a separate step because in some circumstances it can be pretty challenging when you're doing things you don't know anything about, for instance. But it's usually sort of integrated into this whole planning and scheduling process in a way that we're probably just uh, recording this information in whatever our planning tool is. In addition to identifying activities, it's important to be able to, um, it's important to be able to uh, identify these events we call milestones. So a milestone is a significant event that normally is put into our schedule as not having a duration. Now, all events have a duration of some kind, right? Um, uh, so typically what we do is we, we pick these events that are going to signify some accomplishment in the project. We identify them as milestones, okay, which means that we collectively recognize them as being significant. And then what we typically do in a uh, project planning tool is we have a lot of activities or tasks that have to get done in order to reach that goal. And then we put in one final task we typically don't give a duration, okay? It doesn't have a cost. And what we do is it's a, it's kind of a celebration event, okay? So it doesn't get a, a, a duration because, uh, um, well, I guess it's just sort of an instant in time, all right? And most of these tools, particularly Microsoft Project, they have a way of representing these uh, tests on uh, on a Gantt chart, a uh, time chart, where they turn into uh, diamonds. Okay. Um, so, what are examples of milestones? Well, obtaining customer sign-off, um, completion of some phase. Uh, co completion of the overall project, um, those kinds of things. I tend to say that uh, they should pass the pizza party test, which is to say, if you were to send an invitation to uh, you know, the stakeholders involved with the project and saying, we're having a pizza party because we reached such and such a milestone, the people who got the invitation would be saying, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, I can make that, I'm going to go, instead of, what the hell is that, okay? 
if it doesn't meet the pizza party test, it's maybe um, not a proper uh, a proper uh, milestone. Uh, we've got a couple of things here. Um, the, authors, uh, the author likes to include some slides about uh, things that went right or things that went wrong. Um, and I, I get rid of some of them, but I keep some in. Here's a what went wrong story about uh, systems at the FBI um, that went uh, uh, sour. So back in, in the mid-2000s, uh, we had uh, a trilogy project at the FBI that missed a lot of the deadlines and the milestones. Um, they eventually, they got a really bad review from the government accounting agency. And so they replaced it with a, a, a project called a Trilogy. Um, I'm sorry, Sentinel replaced a Trilogy. And then uh, Sentinel had some problems uh, too. Uh, so, um, and the stories here, which are detailed more in the book, they have a, a pretty significant uh, time component with a uh, um, with a, with an emphasis on uh, milestone uh, not being met. Okay. Uh, so, when you look at the the processes that we're doing in this uh, time uh, planning, what what you can really think of these is you can really think of these as things that we're doing while we're doing the care and feeding of our project planning uh, documents or project planning software. So, yeah, we have to identify all the activities. Okay. Now it's important to know how they interrelate to each other. Is there are there sequential dependencies? So, so the sequencing of activities uh, involves reviewing activities and determining dependencies. A dependency or relationship is the sequencing of project activities and tasks. You have to determine the dependency in order to use critical path analysis, which we're going to talk about a little bit later in uh, the chapter, and also in order to use your typical uh, project planning software, which is based upon critical path analysis. So how can things uh, be dependent upon each other? Well, I talked about uh, the, before I talked about the idea of predecessor activities and successor activities. So a, an activity can have a predecessor activity, which typically means the predecessor has to complete before the current activity can start. And it can have a successor activity, which says, the current activity has to complete before the successor activity can start. Okay, and now we can we can kind of characterize the dependencies a little more generally as mandatory dependencies, discretionary dependencies, and external dependencies. So mandatory dependencies are inherent in the nature of the work. Okay, um, sometimes people call this hard logic. So there's no way to ignore these. I tend to think of these like, um, oh, some activity like painting a house. Okay, so you have to scrape the paint before you sand it. You have to sand it before you prime it. You have to prime it before you give it the first finished coat. You have to give it the first finish coat before you get the second you can do the second uh, finish uh, coat it these it, dependencies are inherent in the nature of house painting then we have discretionary dependencies they're defined by the project team sometimes called soft logic and should be used with care since they may limit 
later scheduling options. One of the things we're going to learn about in a bit is, is that most project planning software uh, has inside of it a scheduling engine. And of course, the scheduling engine looks at our uh, dependencies and it builds a schedule that uh, meets those uh, constraints. Well, if we have too many constraints, it can only build a pretty nasty looking schedule. So we want to, of course, we need to express all the mandatory dependencies in our uh, plan, but um, including too many discretionary dependencies can really limit our option and um, is not really recommended. External dependencies involve relationships between our project and some activities in that are not involved in our project. For instance, there might be another project that has to deliver uh, something, uh, some hardware, some software, um, some policies, a product, a service. And we are, at some point in our project, we have to wait for them to finish that. Well, we call that an external dependency because, yes, it's a dependency, but it's not on uh, something that we have a lot of control over. So, in fact, external dependencies are more worrisome than some of these internal dependencies. Okay, so how do we make all this work out into a schedule? We, we have activities, okay, we kind of know what those are, activities or, or tasks. Um, we, we understand that they have uh, dependencies or, or sort of logical interrelationships. E eventually, we're going to say that these things have have a duration that we expect. We haven't gotten to that slide quite yet. And uh, we're also going to say that they use certain resources, uh, people, machines, material, all those kinds of things. And what we want to do is we want to be able to put all that information into a tool and we want it to be able to tell us how long is it going to take, what the schedule is, and then how much is it going to cost, okay? Well, how could you do that kind of analysis? Well, believe it or not, when I got into all this uh, 35, 40 years ago, uh, we were doing all this by hand, okay? Were there computer programs that uh, did this? Yeah, there were, but they were owned by a few people who wanted a lot of money for them. So uh, you'd have to pay several hundred thousand dollars to get the hardware and the software to run um, that those kinds of solutions. So we did them on paper. Okay, well, th things have changed now. Um, you can run this kind of uh, project planning software. You can buy a copy of a Microsoft Project for a couple hundred dollars, and you can probably buy a really nice uh, PC for about $1,500. And for less than $2,000, you've got a really good solution. So why do we do uh, diagramming or look at diagrams um, instead of just looking at uh, software uh, features? Well, it, it turns out that to really understand the methods that are used by this, uh, these uh, software applications, you really have to have to understand these uh, diagrams that describe the network of uh, tests or activities and how they interrelate. And so we learn this um, in order to kind of understand how things are working under the hood of our uh, project planning software. Okay, so. Um, the, the approaches that these uh, software solutions uh, take are based upon network diagrams. Um, so a network diagram is a schematic display of the logical 
relationships or among or the sequencing of the activities or tasks on the project. There are two main formats of them, okay? You, you, one is called uh, activity on arrow, and the other is called precedence uh, diagramming. So uh, here on slide number 14, we have activity on arrow. Uh, this is how I learned to do this kind of activity with an activity on arrow diagram. Um, they're pretty easy to understand. Um, the nodes or the bubbles um, that you see are just there to express the dependencies and the activities themselves are the arrows. That's why we call it activity on arrow. So um, in this case, we've given the activities each a letter, A, B, C, etc. Um, we can number the nodes, although we don't absolutely have to. Where we say A equals 1, that's the duration. That's how many days we think it's going to take to do it. And um, what we have here are kind of paths through the project. When you look at the interdependencies of the activities, um, you can see the paths. Now, based upon this information, one can calculate um, the shortest possible schedule um, in which this uh, work uh, can be done. So it's this kind of analysis that's used by project scheduling software. Uh, so, uh, the arrow diagramming method, also called activity on arrow, activities are represented by arrows, nodes or circles are the starting and ending points of the activities. The only kind of dependencies that you can express are what we call finish to start. And these are only dependencies that I've talked about so far. This is, if I'm activity B and I have a finish to start dependency on activity A. That means activity A must finish before activity B can start. Hence, finish to start. Um, so what we have in here is a recipe here on slide 16 for how to go uh, through and uh, calculate um, the schedule using activity on arrow diagrams. And I have a separate lecture, which I'm going to be uh, doing, that um, it's called activity diagramming, that walks you through activity diagramming in more detail than this. So I'm just going to say that uh, this is uh, something you can do by hand. Uh, please take a look at the other lecture video. Um, but we're not going to go through all of the individual steps right here. Okay? Now, what's the, what, what are the other diagrams that we see um, in this kind of activity? Well, it's called the precedence uh, diagramming method. The activities are represented by boxes. The arrows show relationships between activities. It's more popular than uh, uh, the arrow diagramming uh, method because it's used by project management software. So um, how's it used by project management software? Well, when you put your project plan information into project management software, you can get it to display your data as a, uh, a precedence a diagram, and you can use that to make sure that you have the data in the tool the right way. Generally speaking, people don't use uh, precedence uh, diagrams with all their capabilities to solve these kind of problems by hand. They typically only uh, solve problems by hand using the activity on arrow approach. Um, but, and people only solve these, these things by hand these days in order to 
kind of understand what the tools do uh, uh, under the covers because uh, doing these things uh, by hand is pretty labor intensive and uh, not a lot of fun. Um, the precedence uh, diagramming method, it's better at showing different types of dependencies. So what other kind of dependencies are there? Well, uh, here we have um, the dependencies that you can express in Microsoft Project. In, in fact, this this is uh, this is kind of uh, borrowed from one of their uh, help screens. So the first one they talk about is finish to start. Activity B cannot start until activity A has finished. Start to start. Activity B can't start until activity A starts as well. They can start at the same time. Finish to finish. Activity A can't finish until activity B has also finished. And start to finish. Activity B must finish be, uh, before, I'm sorry, this is always hard to explain. T task B cannot finish until task A starts. So you may say to yourself, wow, what a great assortment of ways to express the interrelationship of activities. And, I, and I've got to say, yes, I would agree. This is a rich way to describe uh, networks of activities and their interrelationships. I've got to tell you that for me, I typically only use finish to start. Now, I've, I've heard all kinds of things from my students about how they've used uh, start to start, finish to finish, start to finish. But since I learned on, uh, on um, doing these things uh, by hand, uh, using activity on arrow diagrams, and I only had a uh, finish to start, I learned how to express a schedule very, very well, which is uh, finish to start uh, dependencies. Okay, your mileage may vary. Okay, so here we're, we're finally seeing a, a diagram uh, that's a precedence uh, diagramming uh, network. And this is uh, the output from a small plan that's been put into Microsoft Project. And um, so you can see the arrows going from uh, test to test. And the arrows here represent the dependencies and the boxes which are kind of nodes represent the activities. Now I just want to point out that these are all all the dependencies that we've expressed here are uh, finished to start. Okay. So, uh, the other thing that you have to do is you have to figure out what resources each activity is going to use. Now, why do you need to know that? Well, a, a couple reasons. Um, one is, when we want to come up with a cost estimate, we're going to want to know how long we're using what resources to figure their cost to add them up to come up with a sort of a bottom-up cost estimate for the project. Um, the other thing is, and this is going to be important in a more near-term kind of way, once we look at our schedule, we're going to want to make sure that we haven't over allocated some of the resources okay because when we did the dependencies um we didn't we we didn't put the dependencies there for resources typically we consider 
dependencies for resources to be a thing that we do at a different time. So for me, historically, I've uh, planned programming projects. So let's say I've got a group of 10 programs that have to be written, okay? And I've got uh, three programmers, uh, Mary, uh, John, and Paul, okay? And let's see, if they're all about equally difficult, I might give a three to each of them, and I might give a fourth to... Uh, the person who I thought was the fastest or the best. And let's say that's Mary. She's our ace. And John's kind of middle of the road. And Paul's a green bean. Okay? So um, when we're doing the uh, dependencies of these things, we typically don't take into consideration who we expect to assign them to. At a later point, we look through them and say, well, I'm going to put Paul on this, Mary on this, John on that. We do that. We ask the project planning tool to calculate the schedule. And the first schedule it comes up with doesn't take resource over allocation into consideration. So if we gave four of those uh, programs to Mary, it has mary doing them all at the same time well even if uh mary is our ace that's going to be hard to do so we're going to do a thing a little bit later called leveling the plan where we take a look at how allocated our resources are we're going to ask the planning tool to to delay the start of activities in order to keep our resources from becoming over allocated okay so that's how we typically take that into consideration not in the beginning when we're looking at these uh, interrelationships of the activities but in the end when we're trying to uh, we're trying to refine the project schedule we want to um, it's called leveling the plan, okay? So, in order to level the plan, you have to know who's going to be involved with what. Um, and so, you need to come up with what the resources are for the activity. So, before estimating activity durations, you must have a good idea of the quantity and type of resources that would be assigned to each activity. Resources are people, equipment, and materials. Considering um, important e e e issues like these, how difficult will it be to do specific activities on the project? What's the organization's history of doing similar activities? And are the required resources available? Now, um, I don't... I probably don't have to tell you, but I will, that when we're considering what resources we're going to put on an activity and what the duration is, we get into a kind of chicken and egg situation, okay? Um, because um, uh, so we've got two issues. One is the issue that I alluded to already. Not all resources are equally capable. Okay, so uh, with people, this is especially true. So the way I described the situation before, it would probably take Mary less time to, uh, to complete one program. It probably would take John a little bit more, and it would probably take Paul the longest. Okay. So we're going to want to, to an extent, depending upon the resource that we picked, we're going to want to uh, tailor the duration estimate to the resource that we picked. And then the other thing is that some jobs can be shared. Now, a lot of software development jobs are not easily shared. Um, there was a guy who wrote a book back in the 70s, 
uh, Fred Brooks, uh, called the uh, the mythical uh, man month, and his uh, point of view was that uh, uh, management before that time really had not recognize that one of the most important activities in software design and construction and testing and implementation was uh, communication. And the more people that you added to these uh, projects, the more communication paths you had. And adding people to software projects often slowed them down rather than speeding up them up. Well, this isn't true for things like uh, Oh, digging ditches, right? So let's say we have to dig a ditch from here to a town uh, 10 uh, miles away, uh, and we and a crew of uh, diggers can uh, dig about a mile a day. Uh, well, two crews can probably each dig a mile a day and not interfere with each other if, if we put them on uh, the two ends. And if we really coordinate ourselves, we can maybe do three crews or four crews. If we've got five crews uh, and they each do a mile a day and we coordinate the work well, well, then we're going to be done in two days. So this picking the resources before you, you uh, pick the duration just has to do with the fact that these things are very interrelated. OK, um, we talk about having a resource breakdown structure, which is a hierarchical structure that identifies the project's resources by category and type. And uh, somebody came up with this idea because, you know, the WBS, which described the work and the scope of the project was hierarchical. People find that really easy to understand. Um, the idea is that you can do the same thing with your resources and make it easy to understand as well. Um, I'm not absolutely sure that's true, but um, there are people who believe that. OK, so eventually you have to do activity duration estimating, OK? So let's think about this. The duration includes the actual amount of time worked on an activity. And for some reason, the author uh, wants to say plus elapsed time. Well, I know what she means, OK? So let's uh, talk about this. Um, let's say we're going to work on something for uh, 10 days. OK, we've got one person, 10 person days. So we're going to start it. It's going to take five person days. OK, Monday through Friday, let's say. The elapsed time in between Saturday and Sunday, they're not work days, but they're going to go by. And then it's going to take five more person days. So to get this done, it's going to take the actual time plus other elapsed time, um, which is going to add up to 12 calendar days. OK? Does that make sense? OK. The effort is the number of work days or work hours required to complete a task. That would be the 10 person hours. We used to call them man hours um, until we realized that that was, uh, well, not gender sensitive. And uh, according to my wife, uh, women hours are worth uh, more than uh, man hours anyway. Um, uh, so we don't want to get into that distinction. <laughs> uh, so we call them person hours now. And we do, we do our best with the people we're given. OK, uh, so the amount of effort does not normally equal the duration, either because of other elapsed days like Saturday and Sunday, or because we are uh, using more than one individual resource to get the job done. So we are uh, we are using up the 
required we are applying the effort faster or because of both okay now it's really important that the people who are doing the work should help with uh, the estimates and this is of course where we really come up with the estimates so if in fact we know who's going to be working on something and we say would you take a look at this and give me your estimate for this i'm not saying that you have to take it as a gospel this might be a person who's a chronic over or under estimator but at least you would know what they think and you could uh, you could just you could adjust appropriately all right now our next couple of ideas are great ideas that I'm thinking that I'm not going to recommend to you that you use especially as a beginning project manager but here's what people uh, have been trying to get a hold of for some time um, so far when we talk about duration estimates and I guess we're getting you know the estimates are the combination of the you know the resources and the duration and you could use that to estimate the cost uh, at least roughly right we're only asking for a single estimate a one point a one observation estimate would it help us to be more probabilistic and less deterministic about that and i'm going to say that for some kinds of projects i think that it adds some value and so way back in i'm going to say the 1950s but it could have been a little bit earlier or a tad later we came up with uh, PERT, Program Evaluation and Review Technique, um, which was the first of the methodologies that said, let's not just get a single estimate for a task. Let's get, um, let's get enough information for a probability distribution, and then let's uh, calculate how long the project is going to take and perhaps how much it's going to talk more probabilistically so we're not coming out with just a point estimate for the completion date and the cost but we're coming up with some kind of uh, uh, probability uh, distribution about each of those uh, two and uh, monte carlo simulation is is in fact a uh, related uh, tool and technique where we uh, we take uh, events that we're anticipating and we describe say in this case their uh, time and their cost probabilistically and then we run a lot of simulations and then we look at what the results are and then we kind of say well here's about what we could expect based upon the probabilities that you've described um so in uh pert what we do is we ask for a three uh, a three point estimate um we ask for an optimistic duration a most likely duration and a pessimistic uh duration okay and then we start doing math okay now uh, there's a uh, formula to, for converting uh, a three-point estimate into uh, a one-point estimate and that's uh, um, uh, uh, we take one times the optimistic plus four times the likely plus one times the pessimistic divided by six so we get a weighted average where the likely has four times the weight than uh the optimistic and the pessimistic and this was the pert kind of approach now what i'm going to say is that um i i have found it hard to get single estimates from people that are reliable 
And um, it, it, especially as a new project manager who doesn't have a, a really highly uncertain project, you would do well to not venture into these uh, probabilistic uh, pursuits um, because of how hard it is to get estimates from your team um, and the fact that uh, it's going to take a lot to, to just uh, master working with single point estimates. Okay, so we have, we've identified the activities. We know their interrelationships. We, we have identified the resources. We've, we've come up with the durations. And now we need to develop the schedule. We need to crank the schedule, okay? So developing the schedule, it, it uses the results of other time management processes to determine the start and the end date of the project. Its ultimate goal is to create a realistic project schedule that provides the basis for monitoring project uh, progress. Important tools and technique include things like Gantt charts, critical path analysis, critical chain scheduling, and if you defy my warning, PERT analysis. So let's look at what Gantt charts are. Gantt charts provide a standard format for displaying a project schedule and they list the project activities in their corresponding start and finish dates in a calendar format. And the symbols include a black uh, diamond that represents a milestone, a thick uh, black bar which is a summary of tasks or activities, lighter horizontal bars which show the durations of individual tasks and arrows which show the dependencies between tasks and i'm going to go out on a limb and say that arrows were not an original feature of gantt charts here and i'll, I'll give you the details a little bit later here okay so here on slide number 25 what we have is we have the um we have a, a, a Gantt chart that is, has been printed from a Microsoft project. So we've got tasks uh, A through J. And um, what we've done is to the right of, of that column where you see task name, if we were to pull over that bar, you could see there, there are a bunch of other columns things like uh, what the duration is, what the dependencies are, what the um, what resources we're going to use. And based upon all that information, which we don't see here, we only see the task name, the product will draw a Gantt chart. Okay, so what we see so far is we just see the individual bars for the individual uh, tests or activities. And we see these arrows, which shows their interrelationships. Now this is, uh, I don't know who invented this. This appeared in Microsoft Project, uh, well, 15 or more years ago. But um, uh, Gantt charts has been around for quite a while. They predate these, uh, uh, these automated tools. People used to draw them by hand. And uh, they didn't have these uh, dependency arrows. These are, great. these are a great feature now, though. And you can definitely get them out of the MS project. Uh, the thing is that those uh, network diagrams that we showed, people don't, typical end users don't really enjoy seeing them. Um, you know, the typical stakeholders on your project are not too crazy about them. So what, um, so what they do like to see is, is they like to see these kind of bar chart, uh, Gantt charts, and uh, a little bit more information about how these things are interrelated um, and how they depend on each other is usually appreciated. So this uh, development in, in Gantt charts, which is 
in the long-term scheme of things, fairly recent, is a, a good uh, development. But it was not an original Gantt chart feature. Uh, here's another Gantt chart out of uh, Microsoft Project with a couple of more things shown. Uh, you can see that there are summary tasks. So uh, if we look over on the left hand side, we can see instead of just having a simple uh, flat list of tasks, we have uh, the hierarchy from the WBS. Okay. And so the tasks that really have the work in them are at the lowest level of the hierarchy. And um, tasks that are farther up are referred to in this um, tool as summary tasks. And they're given this uh, darker black bar with the two uh, kind of pentagons uh, that show the ends. And so you can see the extent of all the tasks that are made up is that make up that uh, summary task. Um, so you can also see these uh, milestone diamonds. OK. And you can also see that you can uh, have the arrow dependencies as well. And of course, the individual task bars are uh, gray. All right. So uh, this is a pretty typical project planning document um, used for schedule. All right. Adding milestones to Gantt charts. Many people like to like to have milestones identified in their project, especially large ones. Why is that? Well, m managers who are thoughtful have realized that if they wait for the final deadline and they only measure the progress of the project by the final deadline, by the time they don't get there, it's way too late to make some kind of intervention. So what they'd like to do is they'd like the milestones to be intermediate deadlines that will kind of wake everybody up if we're falling behind. OK, so typically milestones are going to emphasize important events or accomplishments on the project. I like to give them the pizza party test. And in a Microsoft Project and other uh, project planning tools as well, we typically get that rendering for a, a, a milestone as a diamond by entering a task with zero duration. And that's your way of telling the product, oh, this is a milestone. So we typically have all the activities. Uh, we, we have all the tasks to get the work done. And then at the very end of them, we have a task that says, uh, um, um, uh, design document approved. And we give it a zero duration. And it shows up on our Gantt chart as one of those uh, black diamonds. Now, uh, how do you pick a good milestone? Well, for me, I like my pizza party test. But for other people, they uh, have some other criteria. And um, a popular way of expressing the kind of uh, properties that good milestones should have um, uh, the, is the uh, SMART uh, criteria. So we say that milestones should be specific, measurable, assignable, realistic, time-framed. Well, I'm always a little suspicious of things that spell out some word, uh, but this is a pretty good group, OK? Um, and it's pretty self-explanatory. The only one that I think uh, people uh, uh, is a little bit uh, questionable is assignable. It, this uh, means that we can assign responsibility to one individual. Um, and we can we can expect them to to be sort of answerable for 
our progress towards that uh, milestone. Um, let's see. Here we have a best practice. Um, uh, this is a new slide uh, in this uh, version of the textbook that I really like because what we're really talking about here is time management in a personal uh, sense. So uh, there's an author, Sean Anker, he suggests the 22nd rule in his book. Uh, people prefer the passive least resistance. For example, if you have to wait in line 20 seconds to get a second scoop of ice cream, you might resist it. He recommends it, it, making it more difficult for yourself to be distracted at work by keeping an email website or websites closed while you're working, saving time by adding time to the distracting behaviors at work. So you might think this is a genius idea. You might think that uh, Sean Anker is a moron. I don't care. But I do think the point is important that we have all these tools and techniques and practices having to do with calculating the macro schedule for the project. Okay, But in fact, it's managing the time management practices of individual people that is going to have a very big impact on whether we meet the duration estimates that we set out to to achieve. So it's best to not lose track of some very practical aspects of managing time, uh, particularly uh, during uh, the execution part of the of the project. Okay, now here's another Gantt chart, um, and this is a um, plan versus actual. They call it a tracking uh, Gantt. Okay, so um, the plan tests are represented the same way. There are these gray bars, okay? The actuals are uh, black bars that are underneath them, okay? Um, uh, you can tell if you slip a task because you can see that the black bar is happening later than the gray bar, okay? Milestones what they do is that they leave the milestone that you missed as a as a uh, line drawing that's not been filled in, and then the the diamond of when you when you actually reach it is uh, is the black diamond. All right. So this is uh, a little bit more. Um, uh, it has both uh, planned and actual. And to get this out, out of a tool like an MS project where, from, from which this was uh, uh, generated, you have to not only put in detailed planning information, you have to put in detailed actual information, right? All right. Okay, now these um, these planning uh, tools that we have that are used to calculate a schedule are all based upon a uh, a technique called a CPM or the critical path method, and the critical path method is pretty neat stuff because it, it's it has. Uh, well, it has a lot of calculations to it, and which you'll see in my other video. Uh, it also has a point of view, okay? And the point of view is helpful to the project manager. So CPM is a network diagramming technique used to predict total project duration. 
A critical path for a project is a series of activities that determines the earliest time by which the project can be completed. The critical path is the longest path through the network diagram and has the least amount of slack or float. Well, what is slack or float? Well, slack or float, these are two names that came from the same thing from kind of two camps of people who were working with uh, uh, CPM. Slack or float is the amount of time an activity may be delayed without delaying a succeeding activity or the project finish date. Okay, so how does slack or float help you? Well, it's going to help us in a couple of ways. One is it's going to help us to identify one path through the project we're going to call the critical path. That's the longest path through the project. And um, we're going to be very interested in um, the tasks along that path because if any of them gets delayed even a day, the whole project will be delayed a day. Um, tasks that are not on the critical path um, can be delayed some amount of time without getting on a new critical path. And so how long they could be delayed is called their slack or float. So um, from a project manager's point of view, tasks that are on the critical path I kind of do a little bit more attention than other tasks to make sure that they don't slip. And let's say that you're getting behind on the critical path, which means uh, that you're going to get, you're going to have a longer completion date. And maybe you want to steal an extra resource from some other activity. Well, which activities would you look at? Well, you'd look at one that has pretty substantial slack or float because if you borrow a resource from there and then that gets uh, delayed, will that have, will that become a new uh, critical path and make the project late? So, um, uh, you can use the amount of slack or float um, in order to mm, tactically decide how to allocate your attention as a project manager or and uh, perhaps how to reallocate your resources when you appear to be getting into schedule trouble. So how do you calculate the critical path? Well, first you develop a good network diagram. You add the duration estimates for all activities on each path through the network diagram. The longest path is the critical path. If one or more activities on the critical path takes longer than planned, the whole project will slip unless the project manager takes corrective action. So this math, uh, we see on slide number 33 as uh, this is what I'm going to do in a separate video, okay? Um, but I just want to point out here that uh, the uh, path that is the critical path for this uh, diagram that we see is the one that goes along the bottom, uh, C, G, I, J. And it takes, uh, oh, I'm wrong. Uh, that only takes 14 days. The one that's the critical path takes the longest uh, path to BEHJ. That takes uh, 16 days. Okay. So how you would calculate this, uh, calculate this by hand? See my other video. More about the critical path. Uh, project team at Apple computer put a stuffed gorilla on top of the cubicle of the person currently managing a critical task. Okay, saying, hey, don't bug somebody. This person is really working on something that could slip. The critical path is not the one with all the critical activities, critical in another sense, 
uh, it accounts only for time. So sometimes activities on the critical path might not be difficult activities. So there's, there's an example in the, the text of uh, the growing of, of the grass being on the critical path for Disney's Animal Kingdom, even though uh, they knew how to grow the grass. There wasn't a lot of risk in it. It just was so long um, that it was on the critical path. Uh, there can be more than one critical path if the lengths of two or more paths are the same. Okay, so you might have two longest paths through the network. And the critical path can change as the progress, uh, as the project progresses, which is why it's important to update these kinds of uh, the data in the planning tools. Um, a couple of things can happen. Uh, a test can take longer than you thought right um you could have a change in scope so there could be more work coming into the plan coming into the network creating a longer path um those kinds of things so uh what you want to know is not what was the critical path at the beginning of the project but given all the facts of your current situation What's the critical path today? So I mentioned before that we can use critical path analysis to make schedule trade-offs. And here's some, uh, here's some examples of how we might uh, do it. Uh, free slack or free float is the amount of time an activity can be delayed without delaying the early start of any immediately following activities. Total slack or total float is the amount of time an activity may be delayed from its early start without delaying the planned project finish date. Okay, so the difference between free free float, we'll just use the word float here because the two uh, synonymous terms can be a little off-putting. The difference between free float and total float is uh, this. Um, uh, uh, total float is uh, how much time you can uh, delay the start of that task without impacting the project completion date. Free float is how much you can uh, delay it without making any task that follows it later, okay? So if I were looking to poach a resource that's involved in some other task and I was wanted to look through my, tan uh, my, my plan, I would look for tasks that have a high free float and if I couldn't find any of them I'd look for a task that have a high total float. The forward pass and the backward pass are part of the technique of manually calculating the critical path um, that I'm going to describe in another video. Uh, so here is uh, here's a diagram that's expressed as a precedence uh, diagram and it's a bit of explaining how to do this by hand with the press with uh, diagrams that were created by the precedence uh, diagramming uh, uh, technique. I want to point out that you can only solve these by hand if you use only finish to start um, dependencies which are what we see here. So uh, if you're going to solve either of these uh, networks by hand, um, you can't have any other dependencies other than finish to start. So when I do this, I always use activity on arrow because that's what I've been using for literally 35 years. Okay, here's a report that came out of uh, or is at least styled after 
a report that comes out of Microsoft Project. So we have a bunch of tasks and you can see this is a, a uh, time analysis and we can see both uh, free slack and total slack. And um, one of the things that you can see when you look through here is that free slack is never greater than total slack. And it just has to do with their uh, definition. Okay. So uh, if you look at, at total slack, it's either greater than equal to free slack. And um, so let's look at, so we're looking for a candidate that we're going to poach a resource from because we're getting into trouble on the critical path. And I'm looking at, I'm looking at uh, activity F that's got seven days of free slack, seven days of total slack. So this thing, you know, if in fact we borrow somebody for seven days, we're not going to, we're not going to affect anything. So let's go borrow them for seven days. Okay. And see if we can catch up a thing that's on the critical path. That's the kind of thinking that uh, it goes along with this kind of analysis. Okay, now, um, uh, once you calculate your schedule um, using either uh, calculating it by hand or using a project uh, planning tool like uh, Microsoft uh, Project, there's usually, uh, it's, it's usually adding up to more to getting done later. You usually have a later completion date than um, you would like. And so when you break that news to the stakeholders, uh, they're going to say, well, what could you do to speed it up? And so you're going to consider things. And in this uh, discussion here, we're going to say, well, what might be advisable and what not okay um so three main techniques for shortening schedules are shortening durations of critical activities or tasks by adding more resources or changing their scope crashing activities by obtaining the greatest amount of schedule compression for the least amount of incremental cost fast tracking activities by doing them in parallel or overlapping them. Okay. Now let's look at each of these things in their, um, uh, let's look at each of them individually for whether it's a wise thing to do. Shortening the durations. Okay. Um, by adding more resources or changing their scope. Well, if you can change their scope, that's probably one of the most promising things to do. You say, hey, look, we're needing to get done sooner. What if we reduce the scope here? We can shorten the duration. We can get it done. We could add more resources if this is the kind of activity that lends itself to that. But uh, remember, uh, that book, uh, book, the mythical uh, man month, he made the claim that was not um, considered insensitive then, but might be considered insensitive uh, uh, now that uh, uh, nine women cannot have a baby in one month. Um, you know, certain things uh, take a fixed amount of time. Uh, so ask yourself if you're, if you're shortening the, the uh, durations, are you really rethinking your approach on this and the shortened durations reflect uh, an improved approach or are you simply losing your nerve and writing down whatever you've been told to write down? If it's the latter, you're headed for trouble. 
Crashing activities by obtaining the greatest amount of schedule compression for the least incremental cost. It, this is a this is an old time uh, term of art that has to do with uh, trying to get the project done as fast as you can for the least amount of money, to the extent that you change durations or change scope or do anything else well um, it had better be a wise thing to do fast uh, tracking activities is a promising avenue in the following way if you remember when we put together the schedule they were all finished to start at dependencies and it's possible that things are not truly finished to start. It, you know, it, it's possible then when, when I am 90% done with, uh, with task A, it's okay to start task B. Okay? Um, so to the extent that you, you, uh, you, you accelerate the start of, the, of uh, tasks, you can do that in these planning tools by uh, giving them what we call a lead time, which means that we still have the dependency, but we can start earlier. So that's called a lead. A lead. You can also do things. You can put in a lag time. It's typically something you do where you're giving uh, maybe paint a chance to dry. So we say that when activity A is over, we have a lag of one day before we can start activity B because we have to let finish coat one completely dry and cure before we go into finish coat two. So we can start to work on lead times for activities. And again, if this is really an activity where we were not, where uh, having just a plain finish to start dependency did overstate the length of time that it was going to take to get it done, well, it's a good thing that we're tightening it, 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 it up. If we're starting to do things in parallel that should be done in series, then we got trouble. Because what's going to happen is that we're going to we're going to start to experience the problems that led us to believe that they had to be done in series. Uh, and the classic example is rework. You know, yes, if we guess ahead about the design of two things, we can build them at the same time. But we may get done and find out that we have to completely rebuild the second one. Well, then we haven't saved any time at all. And perhaps we've incurred a lot of expense. So to the extent that you are rethinking the project or you're, you are... Uh, maybe doing things like lead time, so, so you're being more accurate about the time component in the schedule. That's great. To the extent that you're just uh, changing the numbers because you've been yelled at, well, don't do it. That's all I can say. Don't do it. You'll regret it. Have your arguments now rather than later. Okay? The biggest thing that you can do that I think is really adequately reflected on this uh, slide is uh, bullet one, shortening the durations by adding resources and the biggest thing, changing their scope. Okay, when there's not enough time to get things done, then people have to start looking at their demands more closely. And maybe things that had to be in the scope were nice to haves, and we can start removing them. That's probably your biggest opportunity. Um, I mentioned this already the importance of updating critical path data. Um, it's important to update the project schedule information to, to get this to actually work. The critical path may change as you enter actual start and finish dates. If you know the project completion date will slip, negotiate with the project sponsor. And this really goes um, uh, 
with the general advice that I've been giving all along is that you you need to manage the expectations of your stakeholders, particularly your project sponsor. Okay, so as soon as you know that you are not going to be able to make a committed date, then you're probably going to have to go back to the sponsor and ask for more time. Uh, typically, I'd recommend that you do it in kind of batches, okay, um, such that you're not back there asking for a day or two or three every week, in which case you're going to erode the project sponsor's confidence in your judgment, okay? Now, a couple of other things to consider when uh, doing the schedule. Um, there's a, a body of knowledge or there's a technique tool called critical chain scheduling. And it's uh, really based upon the work of Eliahu M. Goldratt, who had a book called uh, The Goal. And it was about this thing called the theory of constraints. And um, people have built an approach to project management from this uh, that we call critical chain scheduling. So critical chain scheduling is a method of scheduling that considers limited resources when creating a project schedules and includes buffers in the schedule, uh, times, empty spaces, to protect the project completion date. Okay, so that's idea one. Idea two is uh, bullet three, attempts to minimize multitasking. Okay, it's common wisdom that multitasking is a good thing. Okay, and in a slide or two, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you well, not necessarily here on my project. Okay, well, in fact, right here. So uh, here, uh, we're showing you what if we had three tasks, and they each would take 10 days to complete, okay, without multitasking. So if we did them in series, we do all of test one done in 10 days, then all of test two, now that's done in 20 days, then all of test three, that's done in 30 days. By comparison, what if we worked in five day increments, okay, and multitask, multi most people think that multitasking is a good thing. Um, what happens? Well, here, uh, in the example we have here, task one is completed after 20 days. So you don't have any output for 20 days. Task two after 25 and task three after 30. What we're saying here, and we haven't even considered that doing things in a multitasking way will probably add labor to them. No, we just went with the estimates, okay? We're saying that from a, a project management and accountability point of view, you do better to have one output after 10 days, two outputs after 20 days, and three outputs after 30 days because you have uh, the amount of uncertainty that you have is over a lesser time, okay? So even though it's um, considered common wisdom that multitasking is a good thing, uh, the proponents of critical chain scheduling would say, uh, don't multitask for its own sake. If in fact there is a, something about tasks one, two, and three that prevents you from getting them done, um, in a dedicated bouts of 10 days each, well, then you're going to have to, to multitask. But it shouldn't be the preferred approach. The preferred approach would be to go after the work in uh, dedicated 10-day uh, stints. The other idea has to do with these buffers. 
So let's show you what a buffer is, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it, okay? So uh, here's a, here's a project uh, schedule diagram, and uh, it doesn't have all the parts that we're used to, but we can see that the boxes, the rectangles, these are uh, tasks that have to be done. And um, what we want to do is we want to put first of all we want to have an amount of time that we're going to use as a buffer for the whole project so we're not going to promise the exact uh, date that we think this is going to get done we're going to say let's say that we figure we're entitled to a uh, uh, a 20-day buffer okay so what we should do is we should allocate that buffer in the schedule. Some of it should be at the end. So maybe we take the 20 days that we're going to add to the schedule and we put half of them at the end as a project buffer. And then we put the other two into the schedule as what we call feeding buffers. We put them in front of critical tasks so we're sure that nothing delays the start of that critical task. So things in the schedule before the feeding buffer can go wrong and we're still not going to disrupt our plan for those critical tasks. Okay, so um, here um, in the, uh, the legend here we say that the tasks that we marked with and X are classes that are going to be done by a limited resource. So these would be tasks that would be um, most uh, susceptible for really getting in, into trouble if we were to uh, delay their start. Okay, so now let's back up and see if the definitions are going to help us at all. So a buffer is additional time to complete a task. Uh, Murphy's Law states that if something can go wrong, it will go wrong. Parkinson's Law states that work expands to fill the time allowed. In traditional estimates, people often add a buffer to each task and they'll use it whether they need it or not. Critical chain scheduling removes the buffers from individual tasks and instead it creates a project buffer or additional time added before the project's due date and feeding buffers or additional time added before tasks on the critical path. So this is a big concept because it has to do with who is going to be in control of the extra time. And this is, uh, I mean, this is big. This is, uh, this is, uh, you know, this gets to the heart about how your organization thinks about time. Um, I'll characterize a couple of organizations. Uh, some, some organizations, I think, are on duly hard nose, and they say, well, we don't want any buffers at all. So we're going to come up with a schedule that assumes that everything will go well and if anything goes poorly, then we're going to beat people till they get it done. Okay, might work in the short run, probably won't work in the long run. Um, organization two, well, you know, we want people to take into consideration that things will go badly. And when we ask people for their estimates, we want a little buffer time in each of them um, to account for that. Okay, so we're going to give we're going to leave it in all the individual tasks, okay? Organization three, this is the organization that is part of this uh, critical chain approach, realizes that things might go bad, tries to account for that by coming up with some kind of a time uh, buffer in the aggregate, leaves that in control of the project manager, and then um, the project manager is able to place that in the schedule where it's going to do the most good, okay? Then people are going to be expected to get the tasks done in their original times, 
Okay, and if they run over, they've got to come back to the PM and say, oh, you know what, this is one that ran over, I need some extra time. And then the PM can come back and say, okay, I understand that. Um, I, I will update the records accordingly. And because of Parkinson's law that works, expands to fill the time allowed, this, it, this approach should uh, get things done sooner. If in fact you show uh, the padding to everybody, people will keep uh, polishing the apple until all that time's gone. And then when you really need it for an emergency, you don't have it. So this whole approach, this critical change scheduling approach, um, is um, different than the hard-nosed approach, <laughs> different than the uh, kind of more lenient approach where we give everybody a chance to uh, share in the buffering. Um, and it, it's pretty sensible stuff. So I'm a big fan of this uh, critical chain scheduling approach. Um, there is even more to be gained from looking at uh, Gold Rat's work. Um, so there is an example of scheduling at a healthcare clinic uh, using critical chain scheduling. I just want to point out that that is a process on ongoing operations and not a project. Okay, so um, uh, Goldratt has some promising ideas. He's well regarded and you might want to visit his website. Now we've come back to PERT. Okay. Remember, PERT, is, uh, PERT stands for Program Evaluation and Review Technique. It's a probabilistic approach to estimating the time for a project. If you're a project manager who wants to become uh, PMI uh, certified, well, you need to know this stuff in order to pass the, uh, the, the PMP certification exam. Um, or if you're a project manager who has a really um, highly risky, highly volatile project, you might actually want to do this. In which case, you need to know the details. Okay. So uh, here's how they do the math. Okay. You take the optimistic time times four times the most likely time plus one times the pessimistic time over six and you get a weighted average. Okay, that's how they do it. Okay, we have a couple of ideas that come from Agile. Okay, um, so the approach to managing time in an Agile software development project is different. There's a lot of related considerations. Of course, the Agile people would tell you it's completely different. So, um, in their core values, they have uh, two, customer collaboration over contract negotiation and responding to change over following a plan. So the product owner, that's, uh, that's either your sponsor or their uh, designee, uh, defines and prioritizes the work to be done um, within a sprint, not a spring. So collaboration and time management are designed into the process. Okay, so that um, how do we how do we decide how to, how do we decide how to schedule things? Well, generally speaking, we leave all the work on the backlog for the project. It's all in a big waiting queue, and then as we come to a new sprint, we ask the product owner to tell us what the next group of most important things are. And then we try to uh, we try to tell her things like, uh, well, these things go together and those things don't. So you know, this is a good grouping and that. And we don't we don't sort of allow them to choose kind of willy nilly. But it, deciding what we're going to do next is uh, comes from the customer, and it's done one sprint at a time. So then. Um, 
the team the team's focus on producing a useful product in a specified time frame with strong customer input and we don't emphasize defining all the work before scheduling it so this is another point of view this is a point of view that says uh, yes we're committed to putting together a good product in uh um an agreed to time frame but exactly what the scope is exactly what we're going to do when it's not all set out at the beginning we're not going to pretend that we can do that we're going to do it um sprint by sprint as we go along here are some suggestions for schedule control perform reality checks allow for contingencies don't plan for everybody to work at 100% capacity all the time. I'll come back to that. Hold progress meetings with stakeholders and be clear and honest in communicating schedule issues. So the last two, I, I think, bear some further discussion. Um, when you do your estimates, okay, how are you going to do them? What is 100% capacity, okay? Uh, is it a 40 hour work week? Do people work 40 hour work weeks in your institution? Okay, do they work 35? Do, are they expected to hang around and take up the slack if they didn't get their work done? Or is it supposed to ride? Do people get paid for overtime or not? So when you come up with your estimates in terms of duration, okay, they ought to be in terms of a typical resource working on your project, okay? Now, here's what you can do. You can say, okay, this is going to be the estimate if a person was able to work their full 40-hour week. But then we're going to take other things out of it. We're going to take meetings out of it. We're going to take... Uh, Oh, training out of it. We're going to take all these things out of it. Okay. Uh, what a lot of people do is that they just say, uh, look, um, it, 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 people have a general uh, a capacity to get work done in a typical uh, work day. And so in five of them, they get about five times that amount of work done. Yeah, there's some inefficiencies for having to report your time and having to go to meetings and, and all that kind of stuff. But we factor that in when we do the estimates. Okay, so um, whatever you figure, um, it ought to balance out. But I think it is okay to be expecting to use up 100% of the available time all the time. I think it's a bad idea to, to expect to be working overtime. So putting together a plan that at the get-go requires everybody to work 150% uh, is probably doomed for failure. If for no other reason, then um, how are you ever going to catch up if you get behind? Okay, if you already have the throttle all the way down, and 150% is the throttle uh, through the floorboard, uh, then how do you get it done? Uh, holding in progress meetings with the stakeholders. Again, uh, I think you do well in managing the expectations of the stakeholders with these, these ideas of having either contingencies for cost and uh, buffers for time. And you ought to begin with having a buffer. So you ought to have, oh, let's say an extra two weeks in the schedule and an extra, you know, $50,000 in the cost. So then as you're getting negative experience, you can go back to your stakeholders and say, well, we had a tough week on the project and we used up some of our buffers. Okay, so now our buffers are down to such and such. You're not asking for more time or money. Now, when you come towards the end of that buffer and you have to ask for more, don't ask for just what you need today. 
ask for another allocation so that you can go and start to budget for that as well. You will wear out your credibility with your stakeholders if you're always in their office with your handout. Okay, having this kind of buffering um, budgeting kind of process with regard to uh, how often you change the schedule and the budget um, is much more manageable in terms of you maintaining your credibility with the stakeholders. Okay, still more left, not too much more. Uh, controlling the schedule. Uh, so, you know, you have this whole plan, but then you have to keep on top of it, right? So the goals of controlling the schedule are to know the status of the schedule, influence the factors that cause schedule changes, determine that the schedule has changed, and manage changes when they occur. Tools and techniques you could use, progress reports, a schedule change control system, project management software, including schedule comparisons like a tracking Gantt chart, that's the one that had the planned and the actual, uh, variance analysis such as analyzing float or slack, performance management such as earn value that we're going to talk about in chapter 7. Reality checks. So the first thing you probably want to do when you come up with the schedule is to compare it to what people are thinking about, probably what's in the charter. Okay. Um, you're going to have a time. This is, this is kind of interesting. We haven't talked about this whole leveling the plan yet. And let me get back to it. Uh, when you, when you put all this information into a project planning tool like Microsoft Project, um, provided that you identify all the resources that are going to work on all, all the tasks, um, you can tell it to calculate a schedule, okay? The first schedule that you see, it's going to tell you the schedule that you can make without consideration of over allocation of any of your resources. Then you can go back and look at a histogram chart for each of your resources. And you can see if they're over or if they are over allocated. And then you can either manually or in an automated way, there's this auto leveling feature in a project in a, a product like uh, Microsoft Project, you can tell it to delay the start of later activities in order to keep the allocation for a particular resource or all of your resources um, within 100%. Well, Chris, that's going to make your schedule go even later yet. Okay. Uh, so there's always going to be a tension between what's a realistic schedule and what people want you to hit okay they have this idea from the beginning from back in the charter and by the time you level the plan and come up with a realistic schedule there may be a big uh, gap just remember that in terms of trying to reconcile people's aspiration for the schedule with uh, the plan you just can't uh, deny the realities of the plan. If you have a good, solid plan, then you're probably pretty close to how long it's going to take. So then how are you going to get it done faster? Well, if you need to get it done faster, you're probably going to have to drop things out of the scope. I mean, you know, we talked about that. That's the biggest opportunity is to reduce the scope you need by that delivery date. Working with people issues. Um, strong leadership helps projects succeed more than good, it says, uh, per chart. So really, all these kinds of analytical uh, techniques. Project managers should use empowerment, incentives, discipline, negotiation. 
So we're not going to get in a lot of the details here, but when we're talking about human resource management, we're going to be talking about these kinds of approaches in order to get the most out of your project team. And of course, uh, getting the most out of your project team is going to affect your ability to meet your, your schedule. Uh, software that helps in this time management area. We know we're getting to the end when we're talking about the software. Uh, software for facilitating communications helps to exchange schedule related information. Okay. Decision support models help to analyze trade-offs that it can be made. Most of the tools that we've talked about can be used in a what if kind of way. So you can look at different alternative staffings or um, scopes or uh, something like that to, uh, to look at what the possibilities are. And project management software can help in a lot of the time areas. The software like Microsoft Project, which it's sort of a middle of the road kind of uh, project management software uh, product, they can take, they can use a scheduling engine to develop a project schedule for you that's much more sophisticated than you could do, say, by hand with uh, a tool like, like, uh, like Excel or some other spreadsheet. Global issues. Um, Microsoft tell the customer story of Mexico's Secretary of the Economy who wanted to assure that IT initiatives align with business goals and improve project management efficiency. Okay, that's good. After implementing new software, their IT team can handle four times the number of concurrent projects without adding more staff. All right. There are a lot of opportunities around. Words of caution on using project management software. Many people misuse project management software because they don't understand important concepts and they haven't had the training. In particular, they don't know how the scheduling engine uses the critical path formulas in order to figure out the dates. You must enter dependencies to have dates adjust automatically and determine the critical path. You must enter actual schedule information to compare planned and actual progress. So these tools can create a lot of value if you invest in them by feeding them with the data that they require. So I'm looking forward to our discussion about a lot of this stuff in class. Um, Meantime, I'll say bye until next time. Bye-bye.